if there's one thing Derek Carr needed in addition to linking up with his old pal Devontae, it's structure, man. And Bigfoot has become a commodity over the last 20 years in that area. Like now it actually brings in a little bit of tourism. There are a couple of Bigfoot sightings, which I'll break down here for you as I was a kid growing up in that area. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you for joining me for episode two of Player Normal Activity here today. I am joined by Seth Wolcock. He's a guy that you've seen around a lot. He is the founder and editor-in-chief for In Between Media, where they combine real-life advice with fantasy advice. He's also an editor for Fantasy Pros, a writer for Jaywalk Media, and the lead fantasy analyst for Sports Med Analytics. Thank you so much for joining me to go over a player and an experience you have some information on. And how are you doing today? Craig, thanks for having me on, man. I am doing wonderful today. It is Friday. It's the afternoon, end of the week. So we are coasting into the weekend on an all-time high. Yeah, it's uh, great to get to the weekend here and spend some time talking about a couple different topics with you. And the first one we're going to get into here, the player you wanted to talk about was Derek Carr. Now, he's in the news at the time of this recording because he recently signed an extension, three-year extension with the Raiders. So how are you feeling about Derek Carr going into the rest of this offseason? You know, it's funny, Craig, because I've never really been a huge Derek Carr guy before this year. He's always been one of those players I've really respected in terms of NFL play. But as far as fantasy production goes, I've never been a huge fan of what Derek Carr's provided. And really, that's been just his touchdown percentage. It's been so low for throughout his entire career. It's really been the storyline for me. But this year, two big factors are going to change things for Derek Carr. One is obviously the addition of Devontae Adams, his former Fresno State teammate there. And also Josh McDaniels enters the fold here as the head coach in Las Vegas. And it brings structure to this team. And I think at the end of the day, if there's one thing Derek Carr needed in addition to you know linking up with his old pal Devontae, it's structure, man. Because, I mean, he put the team on his back in a time of pure chaos last year between John Gruden and Henry Ruggs. Yeah, the whole team, it seems like the entire time he's been there, has just been filled with weird turmoil things. The two that you mentioned, they've had players in the secondary get arrested and like having gun charges, their former first-round pick, Damon Arnett. It's yeah. just been a dysfunctional organization. Y yeah, my whole life have really been dysfunctional. But now, for one, their life, they really enter a really good situation here. And they're forced into it with the addition of Russell Wilson to the Denver Broncos. You know, they have to face Justin Herbert. They have to face Patrick Mahomes twice a year as well. Right there, that's six games against elite quarterbacks. And now Derek Carr finds himself in a situation which I think is going to be very fantasy friendly here, Craig. He was top five last year in passing yards, completion percentage, and attempts. So all great numbers for Carr. But again, just a very low touchdown percentage, 4.3 for his career. He was in the threes last season. When you look what he's had to deal with as far as the receiving core, I can't blame that. I mean, I love Zay Jones. I, you know, I'm a Zay Jones guy, but like he was their number one receiver on the outside playing that that X. If you look at receivers, he hasn't had much to your point. They've had Renfro and Waller really the past two years. Waller's been there for three now, but Renfro, it was his rookie year when Waller really stepped up. That isn't much when you talk about having an alpha receiver. With all due respect to Hunter Renfro, he's not what you think of when you think of having a number one receiver on it. Yeah, Hunter Renfro is fantastic, and he and Derek Carr have established a great relationship together. But even back in his early days, it was Amari Cooper. But Amari Cooper was still very raw at that point, young prospect. And they had Michael Crabtree. So like, it wasn't a great receiving core ever for Derek Carr. Now he gets Devontae Adams. And like looking at the numbers, like Aaron Rodgers is a great person to compare compare Carr to. Obviously, Carr's not as talented, but Rodgers has always been around the six. He averages 6.3 as a touchdown percentage throughout his career. But if you remember back to 2018 and 2019, he was actually very low in touchdown percentage, down in the low fours. And that was the one year Devontae Adams in 2019 didn't play a whole lot. He was banged up. And the year before that, he just wasn't the receiver he is now. And then the last two seasons for Aaron Rodgers, touchdown percentages of 9.1 and 7 flat. That is, obviously, those are spiked. Those are incredible. He had some regression this season. But, Craig, if we can even get a 5.5, a, a, a 6 touchdown percentage from Derek Carr, he's got to be a locked and loaded QB1 back end that you're going to be getting for a QB14, 15 price maybe? Yeah, I mean, the past couple of years he's finished around that QB12, 13 for most of those standard type of scoring leagues. So having this addition of Devontae Adams and that alpha 
taking away some of the attention to Darren Waller, Hunter Renfro. Are you expecting those guys to have a little bit of reduction of their target volume? I mean, there's definitely going to be reduction in the target volume for for both Hunter Renfro and Darren Waller. When you look at what Devontae Adams has been doing, he's been commanding about a 30% target share these last two years. Obviously, I don't think it's going to go that far with them having the weapons there, having Kenyon Drake, Josh Jacobs out of the backfield as well. But I mean, Hunter Renfro is actually a really sneaky red zone guy. So I think he's going to be undervalued going into the season. People won't want to touch him because of Adams. But I think he'll have some red zone looks. He had nine TDs last season. I mean, he's like a Cooper Cup down there. You know, obviously not as skilled, but he's similar to the type of player. Run a lot of zigs. So I, I like what he can do. And then Darren Waller, I mean, you you can't double both these guys. I mean, you can't yeah. double both Devontae Adams. And Darren Waller's never been a huge touchdown guy. He, he, he had 2020 where he really peaked there in, in touchdown percentage. But other than that, he's just been a steady yards guy. So you know, I, I think both those guys are still fantasy relevant. And I think Carr's leading the charge there. Do you think that they're going to be leaning a bit a little more on the running game with that philosophy that McDonald's may have coming from with the Patriots? Or do you think he's going to try to open it up more now that he has like a better offense to run with? Yeah, so it, it, it's tough because I definitely see more 21 personnel coming with Josh McDaniels. That's his staple when he gets in close to the red zone. Two RBs, one tight end. They, they do have a very good fullback there as well. So I could see him in the mix a little bit. But I, I think while it's going to be balanced, like Josh McDaniels has his guys. He was looking at James White. I'm pretty sure they just brought in Brandon Bolden. So he's going to get some work yeah. out of the passing game. It, it's not a West Coast offense, but I, I, I think we could see that a little more. And I think Josh McDaniels wants to put his little, like, chef kiss, if you would, on this offense. I think it will be similar to what we've seen in New England, but I think it will be a little more open because Bill Belichick is one of the more conservative head coaches in the game today. So he definitely had to continue to please Bill with that run-pass ratio that they had there. I don't think you go out for Devontae Adams. I don't think you pay what you did with him if, if you want to really keep it in check. And to your point earlier, too, you had talked about the offenses that they're going to be going against in these divisional yeah. games. The Chargers offense, or excuse me, the defense, they brought in some pieces. Casey's lost some pieces, and their defense may not be as good. Raiders defense has a lot of holes to fill. It's had a lot of holes to fill for a while here. So there's a really good chance that the teams are going to be putting up points on them, and they may just be forced into airing it out more, too, than they want to, depending on how these games go. Yeah, they haven't done a ton. They haven't done a ton in free agency to really shore up the defense as much as the offense. So I think there are still some holes. Obviously, in the NFL draft, they'll be addressing that. But they're going to have to fight fire with fire going up against these guys. All these teams, the Chiefs have maybe come down a little bit in explosiveness. But you got Mike Williams out there. you got Keenan Allen for the Chargers. You know what the Broncos can do with Cortland Sutton, Jerry Judy, Tim Patrick, and that whole gang. Russ Wilson leading the charge. They're going to have to be competitive. They're going to have to throw the ball. And I think the one thing I am excited about here is Josh McDaniel, since 2017, his offenses have all ranked inside the top 15 in red zone scoring efficiency. And when you really think about the offenses he's had to work with since 2017, the players old Bills gave him. We're talking Julian Edelman at the end of his career. We're talking about, oh man, like Nelson Aguilar, Hunter Henry, John o. Smith this year got a little better, had a year with Cam Newton specifically in there. No really great running backs outside of a LeGarrette Blunt or Damian Harris has come on lately, but not really great players. Not great players. Been top 15, top half of the league. Let's see what he can do with some real ballers now. Darren Waller, Devontae Adams, Hunter Renfro, and the boys. Yeah, and Derek Carr has shown, especially last year, he can be a very accurate passer for the most part, but he was able to air it out a lot more than people had been expecting. So oh, yeah. having that diversity of a quarterback, if you look at, of course, he had Tom Brady for so long. I think last year, people might have, might feel a little bit down on that offense just because it really wasn't set up for Mac Jones to be doing what I think McDaniels wants to do. And he, Mac Jones still had a decent year when you're talking about a rookie quarterback. So I think that speaks to McDaniels' ability to adjust. He isn't a guy that's just completely set in the system, which I think is great. Yeah, he stripped it down when he went to Denver, what, 10 plus years ago as the head coach. He stripped it down, tried to start it from zero with Kyle Wharton. It did not go well. I think they started out maybe 6-0 and that year and then just plummeted. He's investing. He Obviously, Derek Carter, we didn't even, haven't even talked about it, Craig, but just got a fat contract extension, yep. which I think is the right move for the Raiders. Like the ownership or not, they brought some recent stability to the franchise now that John Gruden's out of the picture. So 
I just think like the sky's the limit for Derek Carr. And do I think he could be a top five QB? I think maybe his, maybe that's pushing it a little. I think he could be a QB overall six or seven, you know, max. I think that's, that's the highest upside. Likely he finishes around QB 11 or 12. I mean, he was QB 12 last year for crying out loud. And obviously he has a better team now and you're getting him for such a great price. Craig, I'm really this year, especially I'm going late QB. If I could start out with someone like Jalen Hurts or a Derek Carr, as my QB1, maybe have Kirk Cousins in there as the QB2 if I need a backup. I'm completely okay with that. Are, are, are you using that strategy in 1QB leagues as well? Yeah, in 1QB leagues, I usually wait, especially when we're talking redraft for a guy that, to your point, you can find later because so many of these rookies, maybe not this past year, excuse me, maybe not this current year's rookies are going to be going that high, but I still mm-hmm. think you're going to see guys like Trevor Lawrence. Trey Lance is still going a lot higher than I feel comfortable at this point. Oh, yeah. Certainty yeah. in San Francisco. Yeah. Fields, he's dropped a little bit, but there's still those big name guys from last year that are sitting in that zone where I would much rather wait and take a guy like Derek Carr with what the, he has around him. In a lot of drafts that I've seen anyway, he isn't going really in the QB1 range. He's starting mm-hmm. to creep up as he should, yeah. but Man, he's a total value if this offense goes the way that we're thinking it will. Yeah, and how about like a cheap? You could probably get a cheap Hunter Renfro, Derek Carr sack if you wanted. If you wanted to pay up a little more, I would not be opposed to Devontae Adams, Derek Carr stack as well, or Darren Waller. Like, I I think stacks are pretty, they've proven to be successful in fantasy football. And I think this is one of the cheaper end ones you can get that's going to have high upside. Yeah, you can get Waller, from what I've seen, a lot later in drafts because people are still taking Pitts' way up there, oh, Andrews, oh, yeah. Kelsey, Kittle. All of those guys are usually going before Darren Waller, and we're talking rounds of difference. Yeah. You're talking about where Darren Waller's falling. I really like that idea, and Devontae Adams even has taken a hit where I'm seeing him go in the second round of drafts now for one quarterback just because people are like, well, he's mm-hmm. not with Aaron Rodgers. Mm-hmm. To your point from earlier, he has that connection with Derek Carr. Yeah, it's been years since they played with each other, but they, I believe Adams just bought a house like right next to Derek yeah. Carr. They clearly love each other. Yeah, yeah, you don't do that. Like We've seen what that type of connection can do for guys like Jamar Chase and Joey Burrow out there, yep. you know, cool Joe. They live right in the same neighborhood together. Like They are best friends. Like, you do not make this trade. You do not, you know, request this trade if you're Devontae Adams, if you don't want to go play with Derek Carr. We, we've heard it a little bit. It doesn't seem like Rodgers and him off the field were very close at all. It, it was interesting. I, I, I thought maybe it was a different type of deal. Yeah, man. Signs are just looking forward to Derek Carr. I'm about him in a one QB league. He's a great second QB in super flex as well. And even like, he's not a super cheap buy low now in dynasty because he just got the extension. Adams is there. You know, you still send out some feelers in a super flex dynasty league and maybe strike gold. I love it. I think it's a great idea. And when you're talking about Adams coming over in that contract extension, people weren't really talking about it. I was still hearing rumblings about, oh, what are they going to do at quarterback long term? Oh, yeah. I don't know in what world people thought Adams was going to commit to coming there and they were going to give him that kind of money and just move on from Carr. And the extension yeah. that it just oh, got, yeah. you know, 121 million over three years. I think that kind of speaks to your point about this was planned. Once they made that move for Adams, they knew what they were going to be doing here. Slam dunk there, Craig. Slam dunk. All right. We'll see how this plays out over the course of the next season, probably a couple seasons. But I think we're going to be seeing Derek Carr move up the board. And at this point, we are going to move from the football field to the Fordian. But before we do that, I want to thank you all for watching. I know this is pre-recorded ahead of time, but thank you for committing to this time today to watch Seth and I discuss Derek Carr. And we're going to be moving into the topic of Bigfoot here. So, Seth, I'm going to bring up a photo you had sent me, but why don't you go into the background of this whole situation that uh, you were around for when it happened anyway. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so set the stage for you a little bit, Craig. I am from a very small area in Pennsylvania, Kane, Pennsylvania, McKean County, um, better known for the Kinzu Bridge, the Kinzu Forest that's around that area. And Bigfoot has become a commodity over the last 20 years in that area. Like now it actually brings in a little bit of tourism. There are a couple Bigfoot sightings, which I'll break down here for you. As I was a kid growing up in that area, I had a little bit of an incident, like not a sighting of Bigfoot, but we can talk about that as well. It's such a staple now, Bigfoot is around our area that like you go to restaurants and everyone has like their Bigfoot burger. Like it's really become monopolized. There's Bigfoot carvings, carving stores, and like it's really tight, crazy. And like 
people when, when you think of bigfoot craig do you normally think like a lot of people think the northwest i think for the most part. i i always did because the growing up there was that well the video and then you know still shots of the patterson gimlin film from northern california you that's what everyone thinks about when they think about bigfoot yeah but as i've gotten a little bit older and started paying attention to this more when i got into college and stuff there's bigfoot sightings all over 48 even if you want to count alaska i think hawaii may be the only one that doesn't have a sighting in it and ohio that whole valley and then into that sort of northeast there's a lot more there than i think people are aware of to your point and story here yeah and like i'll be straight up honest with you craig like i'm not a super a guy who really believes in ghosts or paranormal activity i'm not really sure how i feel about extra extracurricular life so like but Bigfoot, man, I mean, let's break down this image, for instance. This is from 2013 Kinzu Bridge. So I grew up maybe 10 miles from where this is taken. And this came out, a guy, I think he was actually attending a festival at the time, was off in the woods and sees this. And like, when you look at it, like you can't see super well what it is, but I don't know, man. Unless that's a gorilla, like a gorilla roaming around Western Pennsylvania, I don't really know what else that could be. And, and there was actually one that came out about five years earlier than this, too, in an area called Red Bridge that I, I couldn't find the image online anymore. But it was a little bit, it was a little bit closer up. But like, w what are you seeing when you see this image, Greg? Yeah, it's hard to tell with these images because a lot of times once they're put online, they're through filters and all that sort of stuff. I see where they're coming from that it looks like a large primate type creature with its back turned to whoever's taking the the photo mm -hmm. or the video or whatever here it's through trees so it's a little bit hard to tell could it be something weird where it's an, another part of an old tree or something like that it really doesn't seem like that when you look at the other trees and the other stuff that's around there it just doesn't fit with the other natural vegetation so i don't think it's that and, and it, it really doesn't, doesn't, look, like, doesn't look like a bear either like i like i think it looks it, it does not look like a bear i've seen a lot of bear in my life yeah it doesn't look like a bear and i think there's a lot of people out there who aren't aware that bears do walk on two feet more often than we're yeah. aware it doesn't look like that and it also really doesn't look like a person in any sort of suit because i know people you know talk about that all the time when they're talking about what could bigfoot really be and yes people do try to prank other people and stuff like that it seems like a really dangerous proposition to me because i would think it's a good shot you get shot at if you end up doing something like that yeah um, yeah absolutely there were other images that came out around my childhood early teenage years that people said exactly that once it made it to the news like they, they bring on experts and be like, oh, I, I think that's someone dressed up as it. But this one was always one that stuck out to the public in our area just because it really was like, what could that be other than that? Set the stage with that a little bit. The other thing I'll say is like this picture at least drew enough attention to bring, I can't remember if it was a Discovery series, but there was a series on TV, Finding Bigfoot, that actually came to our area during this time but it, it did draw some some professionals into the area because they were interested in it and from the article you had sent me the guy said that he was there with his girlfriend and he saw something moving in the woods so you know at that point it clearly isn't just something else stationary out there as part of just the natural habitat he wasn't mm -hmm. walking by snapping a photo so it sounded like it was moving away from him taking a photo it may have taken a couple this is the one found online through the news article but yeah, it's really hard to ascertain what else that may be just by the way that it looks. Does it look to like there's an arm down to the right side of the tree there? Yeah. You clearly a distinct head looking shape with another arm closer to where those other double trees are more to mm -hmm. the left. I don't know what else it would be. And it's really one of those interesting things where I haven't seen anything like this. I like to go hiking. I'm in Wisconsin and okay. South Central okay. Wisconsin. So there aren't a ton of really deep forests. A lot of those have been taken down because they're building mm -hmm. out between mm -hmm. Madison and Milwaukee. Up north, I would go camping with my dad a lot as a kid. And I wasn't really on the loop for that stuff at that time. But we never got the feeling of anything weird or saw anything weird like mm -hmm. that. So I don't have any personal experience like that. But if I saw something like this in the woods, I would really hope that I'd had a camera on me too too, because it's hard to get people to believe you without any sort of evidence like this. And then of course, yeah. there'd always be those people that question you no matter what, but. Absolutely. And you got to think too, this is 2013. So this is even when before like smartphones became super mainstream, you know, like this could have been shot on an NV2. We don't know what, what this was shot on, but like probably a lower end cell phone at that point. I will say this, like the one thing about Bigfoot and we're all saying like, why hasn't he been found? Why hasn't there been like any super physical proof? And I will say like, that's definitely a damning, damning question to this whole thing. But I will say it too. If there's a place Bigfoot wants to hide, I could see it being in the Allegheny National Forest here around my hometown. This is dense stuff. Like I grew up outside of town here across the street from me, there's a drive. But then like 
down that road from the drive-in, you could drive down there. And I've heard of people getting lost. Like we've gotten lost on four wheelers back there, but I've heard people getting lost for days. Like it gets dense from there and it just goes for miles and miles. And I remember hearing a lot of stories when I was growing up about people going down that very road across the street from my house. One of my stepdad's best friends, and he swears that he's seen B Bigfoot twice, like on that road, just sitting there like in his car or on his motorcycle and like scares the crap out of him every time. Obviously that's hearsay. So you can't really put it into actual terms of anything, but it, it's definitely interesting. And when I had my experience when I was younger, a little bit, it, it really made me a believer. I will say that. So was it what you had for an experience out in the same sort of area then? I'll set the stage. I, I was in second grade. I was a very young kid, but I remember this, like one of the more vivid memories of my childhood. My brother and I are walking home from the school bus. The bus would drop us off, I don't know, maybe a half mile from our house. And we'd walk down the hill, like a dirt road, nothing really back there. Again, pretty secluded. And we were walking home and like my brother walks off to the side there and he's like, dude, look at these. These are like, these were tracks, Craig. Like I can't like, like we were hunters as kids. We were always outside. We could tell bear tracks. We could tell deer tracks. We could tell other animal tracks. This was unlike anything I've ever seen. And it was definitely two, like, like two, a two-legged creature. So maybe it was a bear on two legs. Maybe it was very, like it, they were ginormous. They're bigger than anything I've ever seen. And I remember my brother was like, dude, we're going to be famous. And I was like, I remember trying to lay down in the snow next to it to like, try and see like how big, cause t take eight, nine year old Seth. And like, I was trying to lay down like in between the steps, like I could almost lay down. And then wow. I fell, I fell in these tracks. I fell on him. I ruined them. And my brother would not talk to me. If I brought this up to him right now, he probably hasn't thought about this in a long time, but he would still be very upset with me for falling in it. Cause he thought this was going to be our claim to fame at 10 years old. Was there anything else around him at all? Or is it just a, like one lone animal creating tracks through wherever? Just one. Yeah. Just one animal creating tracks. They probably went on for, I don't know. They, they, they didn't go on for that long. They were definitely like, it was in the snow, so keep that in mind too. But yeah, it was just like maybe 10 yards of tracks or so, maybe less. But like where I fell definitely covered up the, the majority of something. That you're really like, wow, what the hell was that? But it definitely like the legs apart even seemed too far for a human to walk. So it was definitely intriguing. You ever seen anything else? Like I know you said you were hunters and all that. Or was that just the the one sole little thing that you had yourself besides what else we talked about in the area? I, I probably have to say that's definitely like the big one time that I've seen something. I've always, we spent a lot of time camping in our early teens. And we definitely heard some crap. It was just like, wow. Like, again, I always chalked up to a bear knocking some trees down. But it, it really was crazy the, the, the kind of things you could hear out there. But as far as like personal experiences, that's definitely... I've never rolled up on one in the woods. I would love to, but I have not. Yeah. And a lot of the stories that come out from people are hunters. So people that know the woods, know animals, don't just make up tall tales for the fun of it. Cause they know it can be dangerous if you're out there saying there's something like this and people are going out there to hunt about people not finding hard evidence of one. How many people go out there and find a dead bear, the actual carcass of it and stuff. Nature by and large, especially in these areas where the weather changes a lot, takes care of these things itself. And the idea that we haven't just found a body laying out there, I would find it highly suspicious if someone just claimed they found a Bigfoot body laying oh, out yeah. in the middle of somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be, it'll be really interesting, Craig. I'm, I'm interested to see how this phenomenon shakes out the next 10 or 15 years with now everyone having a smartphone on them, everyone being a photographer, being on social media. I expect more of these sightings to come out. I haven't seen any in my area in quite some time. We have a Bigfoot fest now every summer uh, because of this. So that's great. A local band showing up to the, the drive-in and stuff. It's definitely become a cultural thing around there, but I expect to see more of this in the next 10 to 15 years. And if we don't, then maybe I question the legitimacy of something like this. Yeah. The technology of drones, I think as that advances and those oh, yeah. have more ability to fly longer periods of time and get better videos from it, I think those have a real shot at helping out with figuring out once and for all, whether it's the Allegheny National Forest and all the trails up there or up in the Oregon, Washington, California area. I know that's a different kind of mm -hmm. forest, but at the same time, once those things, the drones can fly a bit lower through oh, yeah. trees and stuff, that's going to be our, the real shot to try to find out some real hard evidence on this. That's a great point. I didn't really think about the use of drones for something like this, but 100% man, because if that's not a Sasquatch type creature, 
then there's got to be like some gorillas just roaming around. Again, Western F PA forest, yeah. which you just wouldn't expect. So that's a problem in itself as well. All right. And yeah, that you can find the article online that was from 2013. And maybe we'll, we'll drop that in the show description yeah. too. That way people can pull it up and take a look at it. 100%. All right. Thank you for sharing that with me. I appreciate it. Why don't you let everyone know while we're closing up here where they can find you and your team over there at IBT Media and all the other sites you're working on? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, I want to give you a shout out, Craig. Appreciate you, man. You've been a great voice in this industry for a long time and uh, big been one of our biggest supporters at IBT. So I appreciate everything you do. This show is absolutely awesome. I'm excited to tune in, not just to this Thank episode, you. but many of the other episodes you have coming our way. I love paranormal stuff. I, I don't know much about it. I don't have an opinion on a lot of it, but it's intriguing to me. I appreciate this opportunity, man. As far as me, you can find me on the Twitter bird at between underscore Seth FF. Over and in between media guys, Craig said it, but we like to combine feel good lifestyle advice with our fantasy sports advice. So whether you're into fantasy football, fantasy NASCAR, fantasy golf, UFC, you name it. We got you covered over there at IBT. You can find us at inbetweenmedia.com. And then you just find me at Fantasy Pros, editing in the back end, making sure our writers look good. And then uh, over at Sports Med Analytics as well, there we like to combine analytics with uh, medical analytics as well to give most of us average fantasy football fans uh, a really in-depth look at, at what these medical experts are saying. Over there with Deepak uh, Kona, and he, he's great. And, and just the whole staff over there is great. Our IBT staff, phenomenal. Love, just love what we're doing here. Craig, shout out to you again, brother. I appreciate you having me on, man. Well, thank you. I greatly appreciate it. And if you ever come across anything else, let me know. And we'd love to have you back on. And for all of those watching, listening, wherever you are, thank you. Once again, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't already. And remember, whether you're in search of Sasquatch or Superflex sleepers, we will have you covered here on Player Normal Activity. Thank you again, and we will see you next time. Hey, thanks for watching. If you'd like more great fantasy football content like this, please click the link down below here.